worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever breathe. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Come on, sing it out. And holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me.
Be strong. 
God, that is our prayer this morning. We want to see more of you. Fill this place with your spirit, God. Or furthermore, God, help us step into your presence. It's here. It's here right now in every single seat. God, would we be the ones who show up? Help us. Give us the humility to step into this place, God, and allow you to be the one that does the changing. Allow you to be the one that does the transforming. May we just trust and follow in what your word says for us today. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, Branches Church. It's good to see you guys. Come on now. My name is Corey. It's super good to see you guys. And Hear your voices out there. Go say hi to someone next to you, and then we'll uh, get into some announcements, I think. Good morning, Branches, 10.30. Welcome. Uh, my name is Yusuf. Uh, I'm here to transition from, help you and help me transition from worshiping to giving into the message. And uh, let's give it one more time for the worship. That was amazing. Thank you. That was awesome. Um, oh, my phone doesn't like my face after I cut my hair. Oh, no, no, no. Okay, good. Uh, All right, so coming out of the generosity uh, series, uh, a series not about giving money, but about giving our heart to the Lord and the way that we behave and the way that we treat others, uh, I've been challenged uh, a lot through that. And I just wanted to share uh, Luke 6.38. I'm all over the place, sorry. Sorry, 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 sorry. Oh, I 
I'm just gonna. I know. I'm good. We're good. All right. All right. Here we go. Luke 6:38. Um, I read it and I was just like, cool. Give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And at first I was like, oh. Maybe it's about money, but then coming out of the generosity series, I was just like, uh, let me go back and read what Jesus was talking about all the way from the beginning at 27. And he said, but to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for, the, who, pray to, for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone take your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them give to everyone who asks you and if anyone takes what belongs to you do not demand it back do to others as you would love them to do to you if you love those who love you what credit is that to you even sinners love those who love them and if you go do good to those who go do good to you uh, what credit is that to you even sinners do that and if you lend uh, to those from you, whom you expect repayment, what credit is that? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be paid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High because, the, because He is kind to uh, the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge and you will not be judged, do not condemn, you will not be condemned, forgive and you'll be forgiven. Then now I read this again, uh, give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measures you use, it will be measured to you. <clears throat> and when I read this, I had to like imagine what Jesus was talking to in that culture at that time. And I always do this, I imagine myself standing there with Jesus about, when he's talking to his people, putting yourself there. And after he said about all loving your enemies, I would like imagine Peter in the background from like, he wouldn't do that. They didn't know what explosions are, so he wouldn't do that. But I'm just saying, um, if you would like, if you, if you don't mind just sharing the picture I shared you guys. This is related to the part it's saying, a good measure pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. And as Jesus was sharing that, the culture there, the, the Jewish farmers, they had this tradition after the harvest. They will leave grains at the corners of their fields. And these grains are for the poor that cannot afford it, that will go and actually will take from that grain. <clears throat> and literally this is what they do. They will pour it into their laps and they'll press it to make sure they get more. And then it will say shaken is basically to shake any air gaps to maximize how much they can get more. And then after that, they will overflow it with another layer of grain. And God is telling this to the Jewish culture and saying that be the example that you are. Be the radical thoughts that you can love your enemies, pray for your enemies, bless them. And this is something that in that time and era flipped them upside down. This Christianity movement that coming in. So giving not only your financials, giving what we learned about in, in the series that we just finished. And then what I like the most at the end, that this is saying will be poured into your lap. You won't have to do the work and effort to going and get all this. God will pour it into your lap with all this stuff being maximized. So as we transition uh, to giving, if you're here visiting for the first time, welcome. Uh, we love you already. Uh, enjoy the ride. Just sit there. As the basket ba pass by, uh, pray. Pray in this weekend, uh, Memorial Weekend, what can you give, not only financially, for your neighbors, for your people around you. And uh, yeah, just uh, bow our heads and I'll pray. Dear Heavenly Father, just thank you for my church, my community here, God. Uh, love it. I love this family. Uh, may you just be glorified as Andrew come and speak. Uh, may you just uh, be the center as we just uh, focus on you, Lord, in our, in our hearts, in our minds, in our souls, in our lives. In the name of Jesus, we pray. May you pay attention to our screens as they do the announcements. Thank you.
Hi Church, I'm Courtney Villasenor and I'm on staff here at Branches and I want to invite you into serving with me at VBS this summer. Vacation Bible School or VBS is a free camp that we offer for kids during the summer and this year we'll be at Lake Park from July 15th to July 18th. This is our biggest kids event at our church and it's a chance to see our kids more, meet some of their friends and neighbors and see our youth group lead in big ways. As you saw in the video, it's truly the best week of the summer for us, and I've loved being a part of it with my kids for the last several years. In order to have the best experience, we need as many great volunteers as possible. All hands on deck. We already have 100 kids signed up and would love to welcome more if we can. We're hosting a training that will help you get ready for VBS, regardless of whether you're serving for the first time or the 10th time. Register for one of the two trainings June 23rd or June 30th, and get ready to start the party. You must be 15 years or older to volunteer, and you can register for a training at brancheshb.com. Our annual Love HB Day is coming up this Saturday, June 1st, and Serve City has five projects this year that range from replanting our beautiful senior center to helping seniors with small projects in the community. Serve City is looking for 100 volunteers, so please consider spending a few hours on a project this Saturday, serving our city with the love and light of Christ. Most of the projects are family friendly and will go from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. This is a great opportunity for community groups to serve together or families who want to model service to their kids. You can learn more about each project and register with Serve City by heading to brancheshb.com. Next Sunday, June 2nd, we're kicking off the summer by hosting Church on the Beach for one big combined service at 10 a.m. We'll be meeting on the sand at City Beach off of PCH and Beach Boulevard. It'll be a morning full of worship, teaching, baptisms, and of course, potluck. Bring a beach chair or blanket and a side dish for lunch. This is a great opportunity to consider getting baptized if you haven't already taken that step. Baptism is an outward sign of our full devotion to God, dying to our old life and being raised out of the water into life with Jesus. If you'd like to get baptized, let us know by filling out a connection card and we'll make sure to follow up with you. We'll also be hosting Branches Nights that evening at the warehouse with dinner at 5.30, service at 6.30, featuring a new teacher in our community. So come spend the day with us next Sunday at one or both of our gatherings as we head into summer. Okay, that's it for announcements this morning. Please welcome up Andrew Shea as he continues our series. All righty. Howdy, everybody. Good to be with you. Uh, you know, a couple announcements there are really important for you guys to listen to and participate in. Uh, I believe Coco said uh, we've got like 100 kids RSVP'd already for VBS. So uh, that's a couple months out. Uh, that's a lot of children. And we're going to be in an open public park. So we need the human barrier that is all of you as volunteers. And if you can imagine, that's going to take a lot of you. We really, this is an all hands on deck sort of call. And that's the same for this Love HB Serve City Day that we're hosting this Saturday. I think the first year we had uh, two different sites and we had about 250 volunteers. The second year we had one combined site. We're pulling from all the churches. Uh, this year we have five individual sites. And the call for 100 volunteers is from this branches community. Now, I just got back from a flight. I was somewhere else. And when I left, I think we had five signed up. So if you do the math, I think we need about 95, give or take, of the people that are gathered with us this morning, filling those spots so that we can pull off our portion of what we're seeking to bring. And, and yeah, I mean, you think, oh, planting trees and helping some seniors in a mobile home park. You know, what, what difference is that going to make culturally here in Huntington Beach? But I can tell you, this is about positioning ourselves in such a way that we show that we are a generous people, that we're here as believers to come together, to be united, to bring benefit to our neighbors and to this city. And that's a very powerful message that you can be a part of by signing up. We need you, if you're hearing my voice, we need you, literally you, to sign up for this event. And guys, I, I just said it, I, I, I just got back from a flight from Nashville. Uh, we boarded at 4.15 a.m. Nashville time. Yeah, that's 2.15 a.m. our time. Uh, yeah, my wife posted a photo on Instagram and tagged it and said this was a total dad move on my part 
to book that flight. It's $35 a ticket. Yeah, that's why you get up at 2.30 a.m. Nashville time to get to the airport. Uh, it was on Spirit Airlines. Um, yeah. All right. Not only was it a cheap flight, it was painful. It's the kind of flight, you don't pay for extra leg room, you pay to bring your legs. That You pay extra. Like, it, oxygen. I am dehydrated right now because I didn't drink any water during that entire trip. So I'm a little dull, and I know it's cloudy and all that, but this text, it's going to make me come alive. There's a lot in this passage. I want us to wake up. I want us to engage with God's Word this morning. We're back in our First Corinthians series. If you would raise your hand to get a Bible if you need one, we're going to be in First Corinthians chapter 8. As I said last week, we jumped back into this study. Uh, half of uh, First Corinthians, the second half, that's what we're entering into. And there was a lot of instructions for these divided and debating Christians who were talking about and arguing about, you know, who's the most spiritual? What's the most spiritual station in life and circumstances from which to serve the Lord? And, and some people were saying, oh, it's a life of singleness, or is it a life of marriage? You know, if they're a slave, did, did they have to become free to really be useful for God's kingdom? Were they supposed to be circumcised or uncircumcised? Uh, they were just asking these questions and debating it in this ancient church, like we talked about last week. Who's the best? Who's best position to serve the Lord? And Paul told them to quit thinking that the answer was to be found in externals, in their station in life, or in their various circumstances. That's not how you determine who's going to be the most spiritual. You know, it's all externals. It's like thinking, by putting on a polo, I'm going to make my golf game better. You know, that's just an external thing. That's just a look. That's just what I'm wearing. That's just the outside. That's just the circumstances. Let me tell you guys, nothing is going to improve my golf game. All right? No, polo ain't going to change anything. And, and Paul's saying the same thing. God's cares are his commands. And we can follow through on his commands no matter where we find ourselves in society. As long as we keep perspective on the most important matters of God's kingdom. And I hope when we come together, that's what we're doing. We're taking mental notes. We're taking heart notes. We're taking literal notes, maybe, so that we can make sure that we're not just dressing the part on Sundays. We're not just putting on the polo thinking our golf game gets better. We're coming together and putting on the name of Christ, you know, dressing for the part. No, what matters is what do we go and do with it? Are we living a life of practice, those more important matters of the kingdom of God? Now, as Paul was sorting through some of that, we're turning the page, and in chapter 8, apparently there's another debate going on in the church concerning the know-it-alls among them. You know, this was a group in the church community who cared uh, more about being right than being righteous. A group of people who desired to be smarter than others rather than the servant of others in the community. And this group is going to be put on the hot seat in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 as Paul responds to this question in the community regarding our proper Christian response to whether or not we can eat food that has been sacrificed to an idol or that's been offered to a foreign god. Now note today, most of us when we think about our meat, we're only concerned, uh, was it free range? You know, was it hormone free when we ate it? Was it loved and hugged and cared for before it was butchered? That's the kind of stuff we care about when we think about eating meat. But in the ancient world, that was a real consideration for Christians. Was a portion of this animal that this meat come, came from, was it offered to Zeus? Uh, and I know that we don't think about that and we think, oh, that's really irrelevant, but I'll tell you, before we get to the end, you're going to see that there's an enormous amount of application for us that we're going to take from this passage. Let's read it together first, and then I'll provide some more insight along the way. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Now about food sacrifice to idols, we know that we all possess knowledge, but knowledge puffs up while love builds up. Those who think they know something do not yet know as they ought to know, Paul writes. But whoever loves God is known by God. So then, about eating food sacrificed to idols, we know that an idol is nothing at all in the world, and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live and there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. But not everyone possesses this knowledge. 
Some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat sacrificial food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to a god. And since their conscience is weak, it is defiled. But food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat and no better if we do. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone with a weak conscience sees you with all your knowledge eating in an idol's temple, won't that person be emboldened to eat what is sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother or sister for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. When you sin against them in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause them to fall. There you have it, 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Paul starts in verse 1 by transitioning into this new topic. He says, now concerning food, sacrifice to idols. And then he doesn't say anything about that for a while. He doesn't say anything for the next couple of verses about food, sacrifice to idols, because he's starting with the punchline. He's starting with the answer to the problem. This is like Jeopardy. Anybody watch Jeopardy? Alex Trebek? You know, he, he, in Jeopardy, this is a hallmark of it. The host starts with the answer, and then the answer to the answer is the right question. Okay, so Paul's essentially doing that same thing. He's presenting to the church their actual problem. He's cutting to the end in these first three verses, and then the rest of the chapter, he works it through their particular situation. And it has to do with knowledge and how knowledge shapes us. That's the big issue for these Corinthians, for these Christians. And on the topic of knowledge, Paul gives us a couple rules of thumb regarding it. The first one is in verse 1. He says, we all possess it. Everybody knows something, or at least thinks they do. Recall with me, if you like or if you don't like, uh, the year 2020. Yeah, we're already going there. Everybody seemed to have instantly received a doctoral degree in pathogens. It was just something that happened. Like, we just entered into January 1st, 2020. It was just like everybody got a doctoral degree. Wasn't that amazing? How we just skipped it all. We skipped like the 10 years of schooling, and we all became experts in disease and disease prevention. But isn't that what it was like? It wasn't like everybody has knowledge. Everybody has an understanding of how all this works. Everybody's the expert. That's us. That's our tendency. You know, whether we want to think about global politics, national politics, we want to think about government in America, you want to talk health and fitness, we all have knowledge. Like, I don't know if you know, it's not just these big things. I have knowledge. I have all the answers for how the Lakers could win the championship next year. I know exactly, thank you, that's my wife. I, uh, I know exactly the roster we require. I know exactly the strategy that we need to put in place to make sure that we win. And, and you might be wondering, what is my like, uh, resume to be able to give you all the answers for this? Well, I have been a faithful fan for two years now. <laughs> Very devoted watching regularly for two years. I have zero coaching experience in basketball, teaching kids or in the NBA. No team management ability. I shoot about 20% from the free throw line with a basketball in my own hands. But I can tell you exactly what the Lakers need to do to win the championship next year. And I guarantee you, I could get into a conversation with some of you in here, and we could debate those ideas passionately, sharing our opinions with each other. Now, you guys ever heard this saying? Ideas and opinions are like armpits. Everybody has a couple, and most of them stink. <laughs> That's what we're talking about here. All right, I think that was a Barry Martinez-ism uh, who, who attends first service. I'll give him credit for that. Why is it that we have all this knowledge, these ideas, these opinions, and a lot of times they stink? Well, it's not that learning and growing and having ideas and thoughts is wrong in its own right. It's when we become overly confident in our own sense of knowing, in our own sense of possessing knowledge. It, it, it inflates us. That's the second rule of thumb that Paul gives us concerning knowledge. It's not that we all claim to have it. It's that uh, knowledge works on us to inflate us, not with substance, but with air. When we, when we think we know something, when we become overconfident and claim it as knowledge, we feel in ourselves that we are more superior 
than other people without actually being more superior. It's sort of the dynamic that goes on with potato chip bags. Uh, I don't know if you guys have ever like, looked at a potato chip bag and you say, wow, that is really going to quench my hunger. That is going to satisfy my appetite. But then you open it up and you find there's like three chips in the bag. What in the world? This is not satisfying at all. What was it? It was air. They inflated the bag to make it look like it had more in it than it actually had. And that is what our so-called knowledge does to us on its own. It inflates us. It makes us feel like there's more substance to us than there actually is. And that's what Paul's saying is the issue here at play. A lot of these people who are claiming to know a lot of things in the faith, if you open them up, there's three potato chips in there. There is absolutely no substance in those people. So what we've got to find is something that takes us deeper. There has to be something that's going to channel and that's going to harness knowledge for it to be of real value. On its own, it's not good for anything. But with this other quality, it it can actually be utilized. I think about it like this issue that we have in California with rain. Rain is great. Rain is wonderful, right? But it's pretty much useless if you can't capture it. If you can't channel it, and that's one of the issues we've had. It's just coming down. It's coming down so hard, so fast. There's so much of it. We can't capture it into the reserves. It can't be used for anything. That's why when it comes to rain in California, you want it to go slow. You want it to come in at a steady pace so that it builds up the snowpack, and then it melts, and then we can channel it back into our reservoirs. It can be used for something. That's like knowledge. You can have a ton of it. You can have all of it. But if it doesn't have a purpose, if it isn't channeled, if it isn't guided, if it doesn't become part of this greater reservoir through this additional quality, it's just no good. It doesn't produce anything for us no matter how much you have. So what is that quality that can guide our knowledge, that can channel it, that can make use of our knowledge? Well, our knowledge needs to be paired with love. That's what Paul says. Love doesn't inflate. Love actually builds. That's what he says in verse 2. It's not air. (laughs) It's substance. It's some real stuff happens when we love. It's what is the hallmark quality of someone who is in God. That's what Paul says in verse 3. So now that we got this answer to the problem, we're going to stick that in our back pocket. All right, that's going to come in handy later. And we're going to apply it to this situation that's troubling the church and that they likely brought to Paul in a letter. How are we as Christians supposed to relate to this whole deal about this food, this meat that's being sacrificed to these other gods, to these idols? How are we, are we supposed to partake in that? Are we not? Are we supposed to be at the temples? Are we not? And again, I get that this isn't on your top ten list of questions that you'd ask the Apostle Paul. If you had a chance to sit with him, I know you got your list of things like, what does it mean to follow Jesus? You're not asking about whether or not you can eat food sacrificed to idols. But again, we're going to see the relevance in a few moments as we unpack this and we get some context. To get there, we first got to understand how massive and how important and influential this was in the ancient world. Just how tied in their society and their religion and their politics was with all these temples and all the festivities that would go on in them and this food that was being sacrificed to these foreign gods and these offerings that were being given to the Roman emperor himself who was to be worshipped. And that day, the emperor of Rome, he sort of had this like standing in society that's a little bit similar to something like North Korea. In North Korea, you've got like the supreme leader, right? Kim Jong-un. And anytime you look at these images of the capital city in North Korea, there's always a visage of uh, Kim Jong-un. His picture, his likeness is painted and and it's, it's everywhere. It surrounds you. That's sort of what it would be like in the Roman Empire Uh, When you'd walk through town, you just see images of the Caesar everywhere you go. And when kids were being brought up in the Roman Empire, it was sort of like with kids in North Korea. In in North Korea, they teach children in elementary school to sing odes, songs to their supreme leader, their, their friendly father of their nation, right? You go, that's really strange. But that was very much what would go on in the Roman Empire. Everything about Caesar, everything about these temples and this idol worship was the stuff that was baked into their school curriculum. And it was always in your face. Like I said, like in Corinth, when you would walk around, you can sort of imagine it like 
walk around Fashion Island. And uh, Fashion Island even has some Greek architecture to it, you know, so I'm, I'm kind of getting close here to the images, right? They want to uh, convey the majesty, right, of consumerism. So they put all this Greek architecture in there. But imagine you're walking through Fashion Island, like this is the city of Corinth, but all the major storefronts are different temples that are dedicated to different gods, like Zeus or to Poseidon or to Aphrodite. You're always surrounded in the town square by these temples, now, the temples were those places where, yes, the various gods were honored, but they were also the places where one would celebrate the various milestones of their life and the lives of the people in their family. You know, for me growing up, it was Chuck E. Cheese. You have a kid's birthday party, you hosted at Chuck E. Cheese. For them, in the ancient world, you have a coming-of-age celebration, and you host it at the temple. And it's like this. The invites are going to go out. You're thanking the god so-and-so for the maturation of your son into adulthood, and others are cordially invited to participate. Everyone gathers. The whole place smells like stone fire grill. You know, it's just barbecue, you know, baked into the walls, basically. And there they sacrifice the animal at the celebration, and a portion of it is, of it is offered to the god so-and-so. And then a portion of it is eaten by those in attendance of the celebration, And then a final portion is set aside for the priest of the ceremonies who could then go on and sell it in the marketplace if he was sick of eating beef that week. But everybody participated in this. This was the norm, to have your social life run through the temple. This was the culture. Maybe you had your favorite god. Maybe you had, you know, uh, the god that was more associated with your uh, country of origin or your heritage, but nobody batted an eye at going to the various temples of all the different gods, even if you were an atheist in the Roman Empire. I mean, because they did exist, you would likely go to the temple and participate in all these festivities out of respect, out of respect for your heritage, history, and culture. It's like Americans and Christmas. Okay, I've got all sorts of different belief systems that are represented on my street in Huntington Beach. But you know, we've got a Jewish family that puts up lights for Christmas, We've got a Muslim family at the end of my street that puts up lights for Christmas. It's like American and Christmas go together. You don't have to believe in the underlying, you know, tenets of the faith that make up Christmas to just be a part of it because that's what it means to be accepted in the broader culture, right? If somebody didn't participate, if somebody wouldn't go to the temple, if somebody wouldn't accept your invite to one of these meals, it would be seen with the sort of suspicion that you see in parts of our culture when people kneel for the national anthem, when they won't stand for the national anthem. Now, I know it's not the same underlying premise and argument and protest that's going on, but for a group of people in our country, they look at someone kneeling at the national anthem and they say, hey, wait a minute, are you loyal to our nation? Are you a part of us as a people? It would feel like that same sort of transgression for those who were going to the temple practices and then seeing that there were people who weren't accepting the invites. Except, you know, kneeling or standing for the national anthem isn't a law. You have the freedom to choose what you're going to do. And the worship of the emperor was a law. There was no way to live in the empire except by agreeing to worship Caesar. Now, in all this, guys, the Jews stood out because they believed there was only one God. It was, wor- it was wrong to worship other gods. And the Romans... They made an exception, an official exception for just the Jewish people that they could have their own temple only for a period of time, and they were exempt from the worship of Caesar and other gods. But they were always seen, just the Jewish people, as outsiders because they wouldn't participate. They didn't just get like a negative one socially, they got like a negative 100 in that ancient society because they wouldn't participate in the broader culture. And now Christians, having emerged from the Jewish community... We also stood out in the ancient world like a sore thumb, a very sore thumb. We too have this confession that there is no other God but our Father in heaven and our one Lord, Jesus Christ. That's what Paul writes about in verses 4 to 6, this confession that we stand in that distinguishes us from everybody else. This is called the Shema, the early Jewish confession of Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. There's only one, and it's God. And here, Paul, in a few lines, confesses that same truth while acknowledging Jesus as part of God's oneness in a brand new 
Christian confession of exclusivity. This declaration created some massive tension that's very hard for us to understand. Massive tension in the ancient world to stand up for your faith, to stand in the confession that Paul describes in verses 4 to 6. Man, that was to be super divisive politically. From a social perspective, people would look at you as an outcast. They'd look at you as strange and weird, especially because Christians didn't get the official permission of the empire like the Jews got. So here's what was happening. You had some very smart, some very ingenious, some very clever Christians from the Christian community who said, man, this confession that makes us stand out as separate, I bet we can rework it so that it actually means that we fit in. This thing that's going to make us stand out, that's going to make us be rejected, if you think about it deeply enough, we can rework this so we can actually participate and there's no problems. They said, well, if there is only one God, and that's our confession, and we all know that there is nothing behind these idols, then it doesn't mean anything to go into those temples because there's nothing to those idols. And it doesn't mean anything to eat the food that's sacrificed to them because they don't even exist to receive these sacrifices in the first place. So we see in this, and this is a timeless human principle, the heart will always find its reasons for doing what it wants to do. That is a timeless human principle through the ages. The heart will always find its reasons to do whatever it wants to do. You know, if I want ice cream, if that's what I want in my heart, I can, any time of day, I can find a justification. I can find a reason that supports the conclusion I predetermined at the outset. You know, we decide what we want, and then we backfill with logic. We backfill with reasons. We say, this is the outcome. I've already determined it, and now I'm going to rationalize that outcome. And now I'm going to justify that behavior. We decide, you know, sexual immorality, yeah, I have heard what it is in the Bible, but there's a reason why what I'm participating in is an exception. You know, it's not really an exception in the Bible, but really God understands it my way, right? And we come up with this justification. You know, there's a reason everybody else has to give their financial resources. There's a reason everybody else has to serve. But I've got this predetermined conclusion that I'm exempt from that. And so let me backfill it with my reasons, my logic. You know, we can justify whatever we want in the end. Oh, you know, I want a divorce, and it's for frivolous reasons. But I can find a way those frivolous reasons actually are meaningful reasons, and I'm going to backfill that logic until I can support the conclusion that I want. You have to understand, this generation of Christians... They had a tremendous amount of pressure to come up with a reason why they could still be at the temples, why they could still eat this food and fit in like everybody else. By not participating, Christians had all that social influence, all that political influence, all those business deals and that personal security to lose. All that was on the table. So they said, you know what? We can think up a way this isn't such a big deal. The problem with this way of thinking that Paul identifies in verse 7 was it assumed it was the only way that people could think or would think. And actually, I think these enlightened Christians probably knew it wasn't the only way people were thinking in the church. They probably knew. There were some fresh people coming to church. They used to worship all the various gods, but now they've given their life to Jesus. And they still think at that stage that there's something behind these idols. There's something behind these temples. There's some power that they were leaving behind for Jesus. And their consciences were going to be upset by people going there and worshiping Jesus. But they thought, you know what? Those people aren't that valuable anyway. Those are the dumb Christians. Those are the superstitious Christians. Those are the Christians, because they won't participate in the temple worship, they're giving us a bad name in the standing of society. Let's get rid of them. So these so-called enlightened Christians had let their ideas, their so-called knowledge, become a reason to dispose of their fellow believers. That's what Paul is trying to help them understand here, that this whole faith thing isn't primarily about food. He goes, guys, when it, when it boils down to it, verse 9, like, I agree with you. There is nothing behind these idols. There's nothing behind this food. You're no better if you eat it. You're no worse if you do. But what about someone else's perspective? What about someone else's experience besides your own? That brother or sister who thinks there's still something behind that meal, and then they watch you go and participate, and now they give themselves permission because of your behavior to start seeking out salvation 
and answers and direction through all these other means, through all these other gods besides Jesus. What is the effect? Through one person's superior knowledge and the exercise of their enlightened ways, they have destroyed a fellow brother or sister in the faith. Someone that Christ has died for. To Paul, that's sin. That's heinous sin. And it's really crazy to think about this if you, if you parse it out, the fact that this is sin. To live in line with something that's true and to assert that truth. They're doing both those things. They're asserting that there is only one God. They're standing in the Christian confession. That's the truth. And they're going about it in a way that's consistent with the truth. So I can eat this meat and so I can go to these temples because there's nothing behind any of this. But that's sin. How is that sin? Well, take that early principle we discussed out of your back pocket. When we know something without channeling it through love, it's worthless. When we know something, but we don't guide what we know with love, it can be worse than worthless. It can be wrong. It can be sin, a sin not just against somebody else, but a sin against Christ. Love is so overridingly important that it meant for Paul possibly never eating meat again. He goes, look, if that's going to jeopardize the faith and the strength of a brother or sister, I don't care how unenlightened, I don't care how new they are to the faith. If it jeopardizes them, then I'll never eat meat again. I'll be a vegan. That's love to me. If you're willing to give up meat for the rest of your life, for somebody else in the community, even though that's his right, even though he's in the right and he's in line with true confession, but he's doing it in a way that's unloving, he goes, forget all that. I don't care what I know and I don't care what my rights are. I'm going to love. That's how massive our concern for the ultimate faith of others and our relationship with them should be. So a lot of education, a lot of context here, but where does it apply to us? I talked about relevance. Here's some things I think we can walk away with principles for us in our lives. And this one's come up many times in the book of 1 Corinthians because this is a common thing he's been dealing with. But just as a reminder, we leave knowing that knowledge inflates while love builds. So are you a knower or a lover? Are you a know-it-all? Or a lover of all. I know you can think it's the well-educated who would struggle with this, being inflated because they got the doctoral degree and they've got the master's degree. And so you say, I'm just a common person. I couldn't possibly struggle with being a know-it-all. My illustration about knowing it all when it came to the Lakers, it proves you don't have to be educated to have a problem with being a know-it-all. The only prerequisite to be a know-it-all is pride. And pride seems to be readily available to us as human beings, no matter our station in life. Man, God just needs the tiniest needle to pop that balloon. And he'll do it. If you're carrying pride into your marriage, if you're carrying pride into your community group, if you're the know-it-all in your workplace, oh, just give it time. God promises he will pop that balloon of pride. Knowledge inflates. The only thing that builds, that produces something, is when we take some of us, whether it's our rights, our ideas, our thoughts, our time, our resources, our finances, the only thing that counts, the only thing that builds up and is worth something is when we take something of us, our supposed rights, our ideas, our resources, our time, and we give them for the benefit of someone else. That's what love is. That's what Paul is asking for. You can stand up in all the things you know, and you can stand in all your rights, and you're, you're right. But you don't have anything unless you take some of that and you lay it down for someone else. That actually matters. That should make us stand out. But there's another thing that should make us stand out that is clear in this passage. It's our confession. That's one thing I see in 1 Corinthians 8. Our confession remains conspicuous. I just like how that rolls off the tongue, so that's why I said conspicuous, and that's the point. But what I mean to say is our confession makes us stick out. We stand out. And we have to stand where our faith stands out. You know, these smarties, some of the smarties in this congregation, they took that confession that makes us stand out, and they worked it in such a way 
so it could help them actually fit in. Just like then, there's tremendous pressure in our society today on us to just fit in, to not stand out, to not have a confession that we're standing in that makes us stick out, right? There's a tremendous amount of pressure on all of us to want to be loved by everybody and accepted by everybody by giving up seeking God's approval and faithfulness to the truth. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life No one comes to the Father except through me. That stands out. That's a claim of exclusivity that was exclusive then, and it's exclusive now. People will say, he's one way, he's one truth. Everybody's comfortable with us asserting that. Oh, he's my way. What's your way? What's your truth? Everybody's good with that. The Roman world was good with that. They said yes to every religion because it enabled them to conquer the world. That's how they could invite everybody in, by just affirming everything. That's how you rule the world, right? It's not all the same. If you think every religion and every faith is the same, read the tradition. Read the primary text. They're not saying the same things. They don't have the same beliefs. They're not calling for the same thing from your life. Sure, there's some things in common. You know, you could look at me and say, I got a nose, I got two eyes and two ears. I look like everybody, right? Have you seen the size of my nose? I don't look like everybody. We're differentiated, right? There's themes in common, but that doesn't make me identical to anybody else in here. As Christians, we stand out. And what I want you to get is we have always stood out. This isn't a new thing because the pressures of this modern world. I think the pressures were a lot higher in ancient Rome than they are in present America for a millennial or a Gen Z or Gen Alpha or whatever comes after that. We always stood out. In Acts chapter 15, when those early Christians were coming to the faith, they weren't Jewish. They had to tell them, like, what does it mean to stand out and stand for the faith? And they only required two things in Acts 15. They said, you're not going to eat food sacrificed to idols, number one. Because you're not going to convey this idea that there's many ways and that you're following all these different gods. You're just going to be like everybody else. So you're not going to eat food sacrificed to idols. And you're not going to engage in sexual immorality. Those are the two things that are going to make Christians stand out 2,000 years ago. You're not going to define sex and the use of your body the same way the rest of the culture does. And guess what? You're going to stick out like a sore thumb because of it. That was true 2,000 years ago, and it is still true to this day. Our confession remains conspicuous. It stands out. And we have to stand where the faith stands out. That's what it means to be a Christian. And it also means that we love. That's one of the themes of this passage, right? That's what's to make us stand out. And I walk away with this principle from this passage, that it's a sin to sacrifice the weak. It's a sin to sacrifice the weak among us. We should sacrifice ourselves in Christian community before sacrificing the standing of someone else. I think a lot of Christians are just all too willing to disregard each other, to write each other off, because they don't think like each other. They aren't enlightened like others are. I can see this old to young. Oh, you can see the way the young people are thinking today. Oh, just disregard them. Write them off. Oh, they're lost. You can see this from young to old. You see the way they used to do it. You see with their traditions. You see the pressure that they're putting on us. Oh, forget them. You know, whether it's this theology versus that theology, this tradition versus that tradition. Truth is, some people in the church like being right more than they like people. Some people in the church like being right and feeling right and superior more than they like people. And so it's easy for them to just throw off others who aren't in line with them. That's what was going on. That's what the danger was here. Ask yourself, do I like being right more than I like people? Do I like being right more than I like people? Everybody in the faith, I don't care what they look like, I don't care how dumb or smart you think their ideas is someone Jesus sacrificed himself for. And that is more than enough reason for you to lay down yourself for their sake. I don't care how different. I don't care how much disagreement. And I want to invite you right now to do something. To look around this room at the people that are here. I invite you to do it. Oh, it's so awkward. To look at someone, they're looking at you, 
you're like, why are we looking at each other? Like, he told me to look at you. Sorry. I hope it ends quick. I get it. But I want you to see the people in this room. And they're not all the same as you. They're not the same age as you. They don't have the same background as you. If you knew everything about them, you might find 10 reasons why you think you're more superior than that person or more right than that person. But if they're standing in Christ, they are someone that Christ sacrificed himself for. And they are worthy of you also laying down yourself to love them. And that's how the church stays united. That's how the church keeps love primary and we actually build something together rather than just a bunch of air. Let's pray into that together. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this confession that we're standing in, the confession of you, Jesus, as our Lord. What you did upon the cross, it's not like anything else. It's a love unlike anything else. It's a transformative love. And so we stand in this confession and the uniqueness of it, and we want to stand out in the ways that you stand out, Jesus. We know that you are the way, the truth, and your life. So teach us, Lord. Humble us. Wherever we think we know it all, wherever there's that pride, maybe we're even right. Maybe we're even living in line with our rights. But because it's devoid of love, you say, that's wrong. That's sin. Lord, what actually builds up, what's the real substance of, of your people is when we take something of ourselves, our rights, our ideas, our way, our time, our money, our resources, and we give it away for the benefit of someone else. And that's what you desired in your family. Every family celebrates something in their kids. Oh, you got straight A's. Oh, you're such a good kid. Somebody excelled in sports, and that's what was celebrated in that family. Lord, in this family... You celebrate love when we lay down our rights, our ideas, our way, our time, our desires to lift up someone that you gave yourself for. That's what you celebrate. Lord, let that be celebrated in this place and let that be what we conform our lives to. Humble us, God. Humble us. Help us to see each other. Help us to see your people the way that you see them. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me this morning? We have a few minutes. We're going to be here together. I want to invite you, if you need prayer, to go to the corners of the room to receive prayer. Maybe you're struggling with pride in a relationship, that sense of superiority. Maybe you're struggling to accept somebody in community. Maybe you just had a tough week. We want to pray with you. We want to bless you. Let's continue to lift up, though, in a time of worship, the one who is superior, the one who can show us the way and teach us the way of love that we all need to model ourselves. Let's worship God together. In a moment of confusion, you are breaking. In my moments of resistance, you're still there. I'm surrounded by the love of the Father. I'm surrounded by the grace you freely give. Oh, you are calling my heart, lifting me up so I can stand. And praise you, oh, you are calling my heart, lifting me up so I can stand and sing. Come on, sing it out. I lift my hands and I lift my heart to you. I lift my voice and I 
I'm loved and forgiven. I'm filled with your spirit. I'm loved and forgiven. Let's just continue to sing that out. Oh, I'm loved, I'm loved and forgiven. I'm filled with your spirit. I'm loved and forgiven. You're alive in me, alive in me. I'm loved and forgiven. I'm filled with your spirit. I'm loved and forgiven. You're alive in me, alive in me. Send your hands in a posture of receiving this blessing. I'm going to pray over us. Lord, that's a confession of faith that we're standing in. And I pray that it would show itself in the way that we love each other. We've been educated this morning, God, but I pray what we really learn, what we really are learning, is the way of love that you modeled Jesus. I pray as we leave this space that we just see the faces, the people that are around us, in this community and that you give us your heart for those around us no matter how different no matter how differing the ideas no matter where they are in their journey lord everybody who's standing in you represented in the worldwide church god they're worthy of our care our sacrifice because theirs is a life you sacrificed for give us that heart give us that love by your holy spirit i pray in jesus name amen amen Amen. God bless you all. So good to learn with you, to journey with you in this community. VBS, Love HB, these are all hands on deck opportunities, ways that you actually can lay down yourself for the benefit of others in this community. Do not forget beach service next week. There's baptisms. If you want to stand in this confession of faith and make that statement, be baptized. We'd love to baptize you, so we'll see you next week, 10 a.m. down at the beach. God bless you. Have a great week. We'll see you next week.